Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Genetic Genius Podcast. I'm so excited to have my guest today, Holly Braddock, and we're going to be talking all about the gut. Welcome, Holly. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to share this info. Yeah, I love talking about the gut. It's one of my favorite topics. <laughs> of course, everything <laughs> starts in the gut, right? <laughs> yes. Yes. So we're going to dive deep into talking about the gut and we're going to be talking about different things like the microbiome, the gut brain connection, chronic gut disorders, some stool testing, which I always love talking about testing. But before yeah. we dive even into that, can you just talk a little bit about yourself, your background? What is your passion? How did you get started in working with the gut? I guess it started due to my own gut health issues that I had most of my life as early as childhood and really not just getting any support or help from the medical system. And I did what they could, but there was no real relief there. Just ruling out more serious thing, which I didn't have. So then I started experimenting with certain diets. So first to go was uh, dairy. I found that was a trigger for me. As I got older, I noticed certain fruits and vegetables were bothering me, but I couldn't figure out why. And eventually I started seeing a naturopath probably in my twenties. And that's when I started learning more about the gut mm -hmm. and the microbiome and the fact that I had dysbiosis, which was causing the majority of my reactions to foods. So fast forward, maybe almost a decade later, and I uh, ended up going to school for both psychology and nutrition. I do that now with my clients. So I help women basically optimize their gut health by looking at the root causes. So why are these gut issues happening in the first place? And there's a lot to dive into there. So I'll just keep that general for now. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. great. And I think a really important thing about you said too, I love hearing the story of how the, you got started and what was your mm -hmm. passion. And because I think that really makes a difference for people. People can relate to your story and well, yeah, yeah. you experienced yeah. it too. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it was a lot and going to, you know, specialists and having all these tests done and always hoping that the next test might give me some hope or some relief as to what's going on and never really getting answers and just getting really frustrated and overwhelmed with the whole process. Yeah. Yeah. That's really common too, that having that, uh, frustration. I think mm. a lot of people will experience that. Yeah. So Holly, I'd love for us to talk about the microbiome, which I think was mm. some, this kind of like strange word that people are like, what is the microbiome? <laughs> Let's start with that. And I'd love for you to explain what it is, what it's doing for our body and why it's so important. <laughs> yes. Oh, where to begin? So there's been a lot of talk about the microbiome. It's a fairly new science in the last, I don't know, decade or so. It's basically the collection or the ecosystem of microbes that live in our gut, which includes bacteria, yeast, viruses, and parasites. And they all play a role. Many of them we need for producing vitamins, helping us digest, keeping our inflammation down and keeping everything functioning optimally, allowing us to have regular effortless bowel movements, which is so very important. And that kind of starts uh, from birth. So if you're born um, vaginally, that you get colonized with mom's bacteria. And then from there on, we build our microbiome, which typically solidifies approximately around age two or three. And then it does shift throughout life, especially um, when there's major influences such as, you know, antibiotics or major dietary changes, stressful situations. There's just so much that can throw off the delicate balance of this ecosystem. And so we're learning now that you know, all of these factors that affect the gut, there obviously we can we can adjust those, right? We can adjust our diet and, and manage our stress and do all the things we can to build and sustain a healthy gut microbiome. And that's going to help us have optimal digestion um, and reduce any kind of gut symptoms, but it also impacts our mental health, our focus, our energy, so many things. So it's mm. super important. Yeah. yeah so important. Mm -hmm. And it's, I, I just love how fascinating it is. Like this, these little tiny microscopic things in our stomach, right? Our digestive system yeah. can then be controlling or managing, helping us with so many other things in the body. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it sounds like it doesn't just impact digestive health, which I think is like one of the misnomers, right? It's in the microbiome of the gut is way more than just the gut itself. <laughs> yes. 
There's a huge connection um, with brain function in general and their ability to focus, learn, remember, and your interactions, even your emotions and connection with other people, but also mental health concerns. So anxiety, depression, ADD, any kind of mental health issue, there could be and often is a role of the gut microbiome. Not to say that's the only factor, but definitely mm -hmm. a, a contribution for sure. And there's many ways in which that the gut is impacting the brain. So one of them is is if people have what's called dysbiosis, this imbalance of gut microbes, typically too many bad, bad bacteria or inflammatory <laughs> bacteria or microbes and not enough healthy ones, that's when we end up with a lot of inflammation. So that inflammation is not just in the gut, it actually enters our circulation and crosses the blood brain barrier and affects our mental function. So these bacteria are releasing toxins. That's one of the ways. They're also triggering the release of inflammatory immune chemicals. And they're also triggering our nervous system. So we actually have the enteric nervous system in the gut that is connected to our central nervous system, our brain and spinal cord. And and so that's setting up this feedback loop too of when the gut's telling the brain like, hey, we're not okay. And that's going to perpetuate or cause mental health issues or brain and you know, function issues in general. I love it. So fascinating yeah. that the brain and the gut are connected together. And I, and that's mm -hmm. not something that has been well studied and known for a long period of time. Like it's like more newly known data, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And what, how many like different types of bacteria are there in the gut? Oh, hundreds, ideally thousands. <laughs> Apparently in North America, we tend to have, you know, diversity somewhere in the hundreds because we're a fairly sterile society, especially after the last few years. Right. Apparently <laughs> in Africa and other places that are less developed countries, and because there's less, you know, sanitizing all the time, they tend to have more diversity of gut microbes in the thousands. Mm. And ideally we're looking for as much diversity as possible. That's what makes a healthy. Yeah. We don't just yeah. want one type of bacteria, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. They all do different things. And the interesting thing is people think, oh, I can just take a probiotic and I'll be fine. But yes, probiotics can be helpful in some situations. First of all, they only temporarily modify your gut bacteria and your in your gut ecosystem. They're not permanently causing any change. And the other thing is they're only very specific species, right? Maybe right now the bacteria and the probiotic supplements that are on the market, there may be maybe 20 strains or so that you have to choose from, mm -hmm. but we want that diversity. And there are many important species in the gut that actually aren't even available as a probiotic yet. The more important thing is having the fiber to um, feed the existing bacteria and promote the growth of new healthy bacteria. Yeah. Probiotic is not like the end all solution, yeah. right? There's way more solutions in line there. And when, um, in regards to probiotics, I love that you brought those up and more in detail for listeners out there. This is a great question. I think, is it okay to buy a probiotic that's not refrigerated? Yeah, I'd say I typically choose the ones that are refrigerated just because I feel like they're more likely to have more what's called CFUs. It's the, the quantity is how they measure them. So active column of colony forming unit, but what happens when they sit on the shelf is they gradually die off. The producers of these products do put in certain ingredients, including uh, fiber and different things to keep them a little more shelf stable. But I think what they do, as far as I know, is they put a little higher dose. And so they can guarantee that minimum, the amount on the label is what's in there by the expiry date. So it does gradually die off. So right. typically I do like to choose the ones that are refrigerated. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a great point. And then also what about once you, uh, have them at your house and you start using them, is it important to keep them refrigerated as well once they're opened? Yes. If they are ones that when you bought them, they were in the fridge, they do need to stay in the fridge in order to keep them alive. They are live bacteria that may sound <laughs> creepy and gross to some right. people, but you know, that's how they're doing what they do. And it's also really important. I, I should probably bring up in some conditions, such as some people that have too much healthy bacteria, even in the small intestine, and that's called SIBO probiotics can actually make it things worse. So it's mm -hmm. not always a good idea or typically it's never a good idea to self-prescribe 
a probiotic, as innocuous as it may seem, it can actually make things worse if it's not the right um, thing for you at that time. Yeah, that's a super important uh, point, Holly, because there are so, like you said, there's so many different types of probiotics, different strains, and they and the different strains then have a different purpose. And so mm-hmm. as practitioners, we're looking for a specific strain for that end result. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. So you mentioned the, the gut brain connection. And so our, when we're talking about the, how is that working? Is that just like a, a specific communication that is strengthened because of a healthy gut? Like the, if the gut is in a state of dysbiosis, like you mentioned, does that mean that it's not sending the same communication back and forth to the brain? Yeah, there's actually several ways. And one of the ways that I like to help people understand. So a lot of people are familiar with some of our happy brain hormones. So that's like things like serotonin and dopamine and maybe GABA they might be familiar with. So that's the anti-anxiety one. And a lot of that is made in the brain, but a lot of that is actually made in the gut as well. They say up to 80% of your serotonin, one of your happy hormones is made in your gut. However, they have shown that the serotonin can't necessarily cross into the blood brain barrier. So most of the serotonin that's made in the gut acts in the gut for motility purposes and other things. But Importantly, the bacteria in the the gut, healthy bacteria, do also make um, the building blocks of these happy hormones. So things like 5-HTP, which is the building block of serotonin. And that can be sent um, through circulation to the brain and enter the brain in order to increase the levels of serotonin in the brain. So by optimizing those levels of healthy bacteria, and there are specific ones that are more likely to build these building blocks and serotonin by supporting the growth of those guys, we're going to be supporting the production of more happy hormones in the brain. And that's one of the ways in which it works. Yeah. It's a little yeah. complex. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's great. <laughs> yeah. I think that's so important for um, people to understand that it's not, everything isn't just about in the brain, especially from in that with neurotransmitters, because mm-hmm. we do have so much more communication that's happening, especially in the hormonal system outside of our brain (laughs) and in the rest of the body. And it's a huge communication system. It's like a big freeway going back and forth and Mm -hmm. back and forth all the time. (laughs) Yes, exactly. And then there's the role of stress too. So a lot of people that come to me are saying, you know, I'm reacting to this food sometimes, but not all the time. And they were thinking it's the food sensitivity. I'm thinking if it was a true sensitivity, you'd be reacting to it every time. So that makes me think it's more likely stress or trauma and the role of the vagus nerve. And that vagus nerve, which we talked about before, um, it goes from the brain and kind of wanders throughout the body, including through the gut. And so anytime you are stressed, we tend to, our nervous system kicks in to that sympathetic stress state and kind of shuts down digestion. And that includes the vagus nerve. So those good signals are not getting through properly from the brain to the gut and vice versa. It's a bi-directional highway there. So when that happens, we're going to feel like we're reacting to everything we eat, symptoms of indigestion, gas, bloating, things like that. But really it's more likely that our digestion is temporarily shut down due to that stress response. Yeah, that's so key. And I think that there's so many different aspects when it comes to stress and the way it impacts our system or if it impacts the gut and impacts the brain, impacts our hormones Mm -hmm. and impacts our immune system. We're seeing so many different ways. And if we can work from that perspective, like you're saying, work on healing the gut, it's like we have a leg up on the the stress factor. (laughs) Yes, exactly. And I always start with assessing someone's level of burnout, which we all have to some degree these days. Right. Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) And their kind of mental health status. Not that I'm a mental health um, professional, but there are supplements and things we can do with the diet to support that. And that's always my number one thing, because as we all know, it's hard enough to make dietary and lifestyle changes, whether it's eating healthier or exercising, whatever it may be. But in, when you're in, not in a good place mentally, it's that much harder. You just want your comfort food. So that's right. always my first step with people is try to get them to a little more balanced place so that they're ready to make those changes. Yeah. Cause you have yeah. to be, you have the energy to make the change. You have to be willing to make the change and mm-hmm. have the tools to make the change. Right. They're like, it's you're going into battle without your sword and your shield, yeah. you're like on the field with nothing to support you. <laughs> exactly. And to keep uh, the consistency because it's not like you just do it for a couple of weeks and then everything's healed. It, it, this is something that we're building a new healthy lifestyle. So this is something that needs to be consistent over time. Yeah. That's a really important point too. How long have you had maybe if a specific gut issue going on? It's not just 
most likely not going to just poof overnight mm-hmm. <laughs> rehab into a new place. So yes, it, healing takes time. It does. Yeah. I typically say to people to give it at least three months to see mm-hmm. some significant change. Oftentimes people do start to feel better within a few weeks to a month. But like you said, depending on what we're working on and how long they've had this problem, especially things like SIBO, which can relapse and be more of a chronic condition or things that are autoimmune type conditions like mm-hmm. celiac. We really have to have patience and give it time to, to heal. Especially if, yeah. it's like you mentioned, people aren't willing to do those lifestyle changes, then that's going to make the journey a little bit slower. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. It's not just the diet. It's not just the supplements. It's the whole shebang. So doing the lifestyle changes, getting your sleep, prioritizing stress management, doing more of what brings you joy, all very up. Yes. Happy gut equals happy person. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So when we're talking about the gut brain connection, what are, what's like your favorite tips? Like maybe two of your main tips for helping strengthen the gut brain connection, improving cognition, Do you, like your top two. <laughs> yeah. Mm. I'd say probably <laughs> deep breathing. Um, mm. Maybe that sounds a little woo woo to some people, but Because taking a few deep breaths does stimulate the vagus nerve and kick your nervous system into that parasympathetic or rest and digest state, you can actually feel it working right away too. Even after just three deep breaths, deep enough that your belly expands, you actually will often feel that gurgling and things kicking in, especially if you've already were previously in that stress state. So that would be my number one tip, especially for those of you who are chronically stressed or have a very fast paced lifestyle. Second tip I would say would just to be eat uh, more variety, but also Mm. eat as many home cooked meals as you can. I know it's very tempting to get Uber Eats or eat out more often, (laughs) especially if you are a very busy professional or you have kids and you're just on the go all the time. But first of all, if you're eating on the go, that's going to cause indigestion no matter what you're having. (laughs) But secondly, you likely aren't getting balanced meals and the nutrients that you need and the especially the fiber that your gut needs. So we want to aim for at least 30 grams of fiber per day. In people that have issues like IBS, we always want to start slow. And if you feel like you really can't tolerate any fiber, then you need to work with a practitioner. But in our standard North American diet, fiber is very low usually. So (laughs) we're supposed to be getting about eight to 10 servings a day of fruits and veggies. And most people are hardly getting two or three. So really doing those home cooked meals, having fruit or veggies as snacks, getting in that fiber, I think would be my other number two tip there. Mm, I love those Holly. So important. And I liked what you said too, about the fiber piece, because so many people have constipation. And when you, you know, say, Oh, how many fruits and vegetables have you had this week? For instance, (laughs) instead of having the like eight per day, it's like they had the eight per week, which is Mm. totally not enough. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And I think a lot of it is sometimes the way we were raised, for example, like my father, he was eating lunch and he's having a sandwich on white bread. And I said, why not have, that's fine to have a sandwich, but maybe have some veggies or a salad or something on the side to get some veggies in. Oh, well, vegetables aren't for lunch. I said, (laughs) what do you mean vegetables aren't for lunch? I said, well, wait a sec. Is that how you ate growing up? Was it always just sandwich and never veggies? Yeah, that's what I did. So that's what he's continued to do his whole life. It's not normal to him. So sometimes we have to really, um, look at our mindset around things and say, am I doing this because it's a habit or what is the underlying reason? And can I push myself outside my comfort zone Mm -hmm. and try new things? Cause it's really hard to get eight to 10 servings when you're only eating them at dinner. (laughs) This is true. Yeah. You're going to have like a massive salad. Yeah. And uh, that's super important too, what you said about that genetic component and what our, and what our habits are from our family, because grown up through many generations. And I think, especially people, if you're listening and you had parents that were in that kind of like 50s age with Betty Crocker and things like that. There was this whole phase of frozen dinners and making Mm -hmm. all these strange. I think that really impacted a lot of the children that grew up in that time period because my patients that had were in that time period, they have really poor eating habits because the everything became it's in a package. It's super cool instead of like because they want things to be fast and easy. And the 50s are so different for cooking. (laughs) Yeah, it was the novelty of the convenience foods that were just coming out. Yeah. 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 And now we're in this new stage of super, super fast or super, super wholesome. It's like there's not like this, (laughs) we need like the in-between. Yeah. Yeah. And like you said too, getting making your meals at home. Cause that there's the food you're 
you have that impact of controlling what you're eating, but also mm-hmm. the environment, whether you're eating it with your friends or your family or not in front of the TV, breathing yeah. while you're eating, all those are so important. Not watching the news while you're eating. I oh, had God. a client who was doing that. And, and she told me even just with that one change, I think she had said she hadn't really changed much else, but she did manage to stop watching the news with dinner and her digestion improved considerably. And I said, mm-hmm. that's because you were in that stress state. You need to be make dinner time, a calm, relaxing time, every meal right. really. Right. But yes, yeah. yes, right. Every meal, this is true. <laughs> but yeah, especially um, if you're doing things that are causing you stress while you're eating, whether that's driving in traffic on the way to work in the morning mm-hmm. or- or, or eating, like you said, watching news, eating, some, doing stressful or having a stressful environment where maybe your kids are all over the place. So you do have to look at that. Do you use a, like a food journal with your clients where you're looking at specific things, environment, symptoms, all of that? Yeah. Sometimes it really depends on the person and their willingness to do so. I guess I do right. bring it up and if they're mm-hmm. willing to try it, then we do track that. So not just what they're eating, but their emotions before and during eating and after, for example, if they were to have a treat, are they feeling guilty after? And that helps me to see if they track their symptoms as well, which foods might be triggering symptoms, but it also helps me weed out if they said that they had a reaction, but they also were highly stressed when they were eating. We can't really weed out and say that food is a sensitivity because it could very well just be the stress. So then we have to do a controlled experiment and have them try that food when they're not stressed. Uh, If someone has a lot of anxiety and stress, that can be challenging. Like you said in the beginning, mm -hmm. you want to give the... um, the person, the patient, the client, that environment of relaxation before we try to make a lot of heavy duty changes, which might not be realistic in that For place sure. where we're not even sure what's going on. <laughs> yeah. I think it's really important as a practitioner to assess the readiness for change mm-hmm. in a client or a patient and just to meet them where they're at. Because a lot of people in my mind, I'm like, Oh, great. I can give them all these dietary changes and this big fancy (laughs) protocol. But if they have kids at home and a really stressful job and they're working overtime and like, it's just not realistic for many people. So we really have to go slow and build the goals together, the dietary goals together as to what they think is doable. Yeah, that's super important that you said that because it is important to know what someone's capable of doing, willing to do, and then able mm-hmm. to actually follow through with it. Yeah, because <laughs> all exactly. those come into play for the healing treatment plan for sure. Um, yeah, and they don't, you don't want them to feel discouraged, right? If you right. give them all these things to change and they're not able to do any of them, and then they feel overwhelmed, and then they feel like a failure that they couldn't follow through. Nobody wants yeah. that in their healing journey. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that it doesn't have a good outcome. No. Um, what are some of the the like main top chronic gut conditions that you see in your practice? Yeah, I see a lot of either self-diagnosed or the doctor has told them that they have quote unquote IBS and right. air quotes. Here. Right. Yes. Uh, <laughs> IBS. IBS. Yeah. Right. It's not a real diagnosis. It's basically once um, your doctor or practitioner has ruled out other more serious issues, they put you into this wastebasket category of IBS, basically saying that there's something functionally wrong. It's not necessarily that there's anything um, structurally wrong. There's no ulceration or serious issues, but we just don't know why your gut isn't functioning properly. <laughs> we and, don't know. <laughs> you know so basically you can try cutting out this or that. And hopefully if you avoid your trigger foods, you're going to be okay. And that's not the solution. <laughs> no. But, yeah. I'd say that quote unquote IBS is probably one of the more common ones. A lot of bloating, a mm-hmm. lot of constipation, right. especially in the last few years. And I tend to see that with stress more so than diarrhea and a lot of food sensitivities or suspected food sensitivities. Yeah. Yeah. I see those a lot in my practice too. Yeah. Very common, especially like you said, during the past couple of years through the pandemic, people have been more stressed. So they hold on to things because they're afraid. And so that can create constipation or they're eating really poorly (laughs) or they were trying to eat better (laughs) and they were having more food sensitivities. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. What type of food sensitive, do you do testing for food sensitivity or do you do uh, like gold standard elimination? What's your kind of MO when it comes to food Yeah. So I used to offer the IgG blood-based food sensitivity testing. Personally, I just found it wasn't very helpful for my clients and it was an added cost that didn't really give us a whole lot extra information than we would have gotten with an elimination diet. Mm -hmm. I also, from what I've learned, heard that some of the things that come up on there, random things like oranges or cucumbers, or oftentimes they can be false positives. Right. And I, a lot of my clients have already done a lot of really strict diets and have this like fear of food. So I don't want them to feel even more fear of food and feel like they have to cut out 
almost everything and just be overwhelmed and like, what, what is there left to eat? So right. really putting extra stress on them. I said, you know, when people come to me with these tests and they say, yeah, like someone did this test with me and they told me I had to cut all this out, but really I don't feel sick when I eat oranges or I don't feel sick when I eat cucumbers. And I said, well, then don't worry about it. If there's something on there like gluten or dairy and you do notice a big reaction, then for sure we'll, we'll want to avoid it until right. we, at least until we heal your gut a bit more. But I, yeah, I personally don't use them for that reason. I don't think that there's not necessarily no benefit. Definitely there is a benefit at the right place and time. The other issue there being most people that come to me have leaky gut. So once you have this dysbiosis or this bacteria imbalance long enough, uh, most people develop leaky gut. The tight junctions or the, the you know seals between the intestinal cells are no longer tight and things are leaking into the bloodstream. And that's when your body starts flagging these food particles and creating food sensitivities. So at that point in their healing journey, that test is basically just telling me what they've been eating. Right. right. What's everything. leaking out. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Going into the bloodstream when it's not supposed to be. So if I was to use it, I would probably do this for our healing protocol, give it at least three months of healing and see how they're doing then. And then potentially use it down the road if that's something they really wanted to do. But typically I'd rather we just do the protocol and possibly they save their money for a GI map test instead. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's great, Holly. Cause I think that's really important because the, I think that Sometimes, like you said, we can have information from those food sensitivity tests that can be harmful for someone who's already so restrictive. I'd mm -hmm. like to see them. Sometimes I'll use them for like grouping, like you said, like dairy or gluten. I'm like, oh yeah. So here it shows that you're allergic or you're having a reaction to every grain, <laughs> every, <laughs> so it does, it does give us that information. Like you said, there's definitely some reactions going on, but mm -hmm. um, I think I had a patient who's, it was like lettuce and strawberries. And <laughs> I was like, okay, eliminate them and then bring them back in and see how you feel. And uh, like you said, it all comes about healing the gut. Cause when we, mm -hmm. when that leaky gut comes into play, that can be a big factor for really knowing that we need to heal those gap junctions, get in there and heal the lining of the gap. Yeah. And so that things stay in where they're supposed to stay in. <laughs> yeah. And that's, what's very promising. I let people know that too. If, even if they come to me and they do feel like they have quite a few food sensitivities, I say like, look, don't worry. Like eventually as we heal the gut and repair that gut lining, you're very likely to be able to bring some of these foods back in. So that kind of gives them right. hope that they'll be able to have more variety in their diet eventually. Yeah, yeah, which is so key, especially for people, patients that are very restrictive or have been told mm -hmm. to be very restrictive. I'm not eating anything. Okay, we need to bring some foods back in. Please try these foods so you're eating more than just Yeah, <laughs> and that's what worries me too, because at that point, we're looking at nutrient deficiencies for sure. Mm -hmm. But also, as we talked about diversity um, of foods and, and diversity of microbes in the gut, much like in an ecosystem, every different microbe or bacteria likes to eat a different type of fiber. So if we're only eating the same five or 10 foods, we're only feeding certain bacteria. In order to get that mm -hmm. diversity in your microbiome, we need a diversity of food. The goal really should be if those the diets are made to be used for about uh, six months or so when you're working with a practitioner as a temporary healing tool, and then eventually bring some of these foods back in so that we can help to rebuild and restore that microbiome. Yeah. They're not a yeah. lifetime of a dietary yeah. change. <laughs> That's exactly. way too restrictive. Like you said, I think there was a study done that showed that co the common American eats the same 30 foods and that's it. Like just like wow. rotating. And I'm like, that is so limiting, right? When we and eat it's like, boring <laughs> and boring. Yeah. yeah. So that's one thing I always work with patients first too, is like, okay, so tell, I can see that from a food diary, kind of what they've been eating, but then, mm -hmm. you know, where they've been shopping too. Have you been shopping on the outside of the aisles, the inside, what's mm -hmm. your common like meals that you always make all the time? <laughs> yes, exactly. And I even get into that rut sometimes too, especially when you're tired and you have a busy right. week and you just kind of grab the same things you always get because you don't have the bandwidth to to think of new recipes and try different things but I think I always give my clients this goal of trying a new recipe maybe once a week or every other right. week whatever mm -hmm. is doable for them and just challenging themselves to get outside their their normal routine and and try some new fruits and vegetables 
Yeah, yeah, that's so true. And eating seasonally as we're moving into spring is so beneficial too, because yeah. fresh vegetables and fresh fruits, winter is a little harder for the, the freshest stuff. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I like what you said too, about ha- trying a new meal of once a week. How fun is that? Creating mm-hmm. some variety and uh, everything does get boring when you're in the routine and busy, right? Like reaching for the same like spaghetti or whatever you're going to be. Yes. Eating. The go-tos. <laughs> right. The go-tos tacos. We yeah. always have taco Tuesday at my house. I love it. Oh, awesome. <laughs> but there's lots of variety. Varieties of tacos. <laughs> you know, yeah, so, I just yes. had fish tacos the other day, <laughs> yeah. which was delicious. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. I love Taco Tuesday. Okay, so you're seeing mainly the IBS and some celiac, because that was the other one that you mentioned in your yeah. practice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's pretty common. Can you explain a little bit about the testing for celiac? Cause I think that has some misnomers too about, is it just one test? And then uh, is it a false positive, false negative? What goes behind those te- that testing? Mm-hmm. For celiac? Yeah, I don't do the testing myself. I'm limited as nutritionist as to what tests I can do, but I do think it's important to not just get, for example, if someone did an IgG sensitivity test, yes, that's showing that you're reacting to wheat, but we need to make sure that it's actually an autoimmune type reaction where you would go either with a naturopath or to your doctor and get, I believe it's the tissue transglutaminase. Um, There's a couple other ones as well maybe you can rhyme them off there, but um, <laughs> those are the ones that's showing an actual, like an autoimmune type reaction, right? Your right. Yeah. Yeah. Totally important. Yeah. So you can do the transglutaminase you could also do a genetic test specifically. And, and I think it's, it's important to have all of the, that full circle. And mm. especially like you said, from the autoimmune perspective, because that is going to have a different kind of treatment or goal oriented plan for healing the gut. <laughs> Yes, definitely. I see a lot of people that whether it's celiac or they've developed IBD, so Crohn's or colitis, whatever it may be, if it goes unchecked for quite a while, once you have one autoimmune disease that becomes other autoimmune diseases, right? So your body is just attacking your tissues and creating this systemic inflammation. So if that doesn't get controlled, um, then we're going to develop other issues as well. So we really need Mm -hmm. to figure out right from the get-go, is this actually an autoimmune condition or more like a sensitivity? And part of what I do is go through people's uh, medical history, including their uh, family history. So if there is a family history of uh, celiac or other mm-hmm. autoimmune diseases, I highly recommend they see their doctor or maybe if they're working with a naturopath to get that kind of testing done. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's super important because there's that commonality and also genetically that genetic component, it doesn't necessarily guarantee or prove that you're going to have that in, in your genetics yourself, but you can have the predisposition to inherit mm-hmm. that gene. So it's more likely like thyroid is very common. If I have a, if I'm seeing a patient with several um, relatives have some high thyroid issues, then I do yeah. always recommend that we do some thyroid testing. So same with the gut, it's all connected in there. <laughs> yes, exactly. And it's one of those things where, yes, you might have the gene, even if you did some genetic testing and found out you did have the gene for that particular autoimmune disease, say it was celiac, that like, doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get it. It's more like the epigenetic, the lifestyle and environment factors. What's your stress level? What's your diet? What's your, your whole lifestyle? And if all of those things are in check, then your you know, microbiome is balanced, That's um, right. then you're less likely to get it. So just because you have that gene doesn't mean you're, it's inevitable. Yeah. Right. No, it's all, and it's great information, right? From that, especially mm-hmm. from that gut prevention standpoint, you're like, okay, like you said, let's make sure everything is in check for moving forward. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about gut healing diet. So you mentioned a a little bit about that earlier. And do you think that when someone is on a gut healing diet, it can be something that can be really helpful or does it need, are there deeper issues that need to be addressed? Is it more holistic where lots of different things come in? Cause I know there's different, I wouldn't call them like fads, but I guess they are different fad diets for healing the gut. (laughs) Yes, I know. And there's like the celery juice and all these different cleanses and stuff. And most of my clients that come to me have tried a lot of these and and I said, yeah, how do they help you? And they said, well, yeah, a little bit temporarily, but first of all, they say it's not sustainable. A lot of them. Right. Of course you can't do a celery juice diet for like your lifetime. (laughs) Yeah. Or they say I did it to a T and I still didn't get the relief that I needed. Like I got some relief, but still didn't really feel my best. So Mm -hmm. I, I know there's something else going on and there usually is. Um, So I think these diets, um, they all have a place. And the ones that I typically use the most with clients in a therapeutic fashion, meaning typically at the beginning of their healing journey for a period of a month to three months, depending Mm -hmm. on what's going on, that would be something like low FODMAP. So that's Mm -hmm. a diet where we reduce FODMAPs, which are fermentable carbs in food. So that's things, um, foods like 
broccoli and asparagus and um, artichokes and things like that, um, which are going to worsen gas and bloating. So the bacteria is taking those and fermenting it and causing gas bloating and in some people pain. Mm -hmm. um, so they are also feeding the bacteria that we're trying to kill when we're doing this four step protocol. And the first phase is helping. One of the things is to kill off that bacterial overgrowth or imbalance, right? And so if we starve them of the food they need to survive, then that helps us kill them um, while we're also killing them with the supplements as well. So I do use these temporarily. Um, depending on what's going on, especially if someone has upper gut issues like SIBO. I do also use sometimes a low histamine diet in conjunction mm -hmm. with low FODMAP. So a lot of people that have chronic gut issues, whether that's sensitivities or IBS or whatever it may be, typically because they have this bacterial imbalance, they don't have enough of an enzyme that breaks down histamine in the gut called DAO. And when that happens, that histamine builds up in the body and can cause allergy-like symptoms and brain fog and all of that fun mm -hmm. stuff. We do need histamine in our body for many functions, but it's like a bucket uh, analogy and you need some in your bucket, but once the bucket gets full and starts overflowing, that's when you start to get symptoms. Really the goal there is to, again, minimize high histamine foods, things that are fermented and whatnot while we're balancing that microbiome. And eventually we get it to a place where we can try to reintroduce them again, because a lot of them like fermented foods are very healthy for the gut, but again, they are high in histamine and anyone that's having that kind of reaction, we need to temporarily limit. Yeah. Those are two great examples of those Holly, especially too, because I think people use Google <laughs> as their resource and there's lots of different diet diets out there for the digestive system. And just tr picking one and trying it is not going to be the right, the solution most likely. So yes. working <laughs> with someone that's well-trained like yourself really helps guide them. You're like, okay, this is what's going on. This is the nutritional plan. It's going to be the best for you you for this short period of time. And I see it all the time in my practice, people come in like, oh yeah, I tried this for a little while. Then I try that. <laughs> like, but yeah. you didn't know, you just kind of picked one randomly out of a hat. Yeah. And then even some people, they find out about the, the gut microbiome issue and they start taking supplements to kill the bacteria, right. but they don't follow through and do the whole four-step protocol to repair and then restore the microbiome. And then they get stuck with recurring issues because they're not doing it the way it was intended to be done in order to fully heal the gut. So yeah, that's yeah, so important. Doing it yourself, the DIY is, is not a great route. I know what people try to save money, but ultimately it, in my experience, anyways, you end up spending a lot more money mm -hmm. on, you know, random supplements that you try and don't work. And then they go in the, the supplement graveyard and you're in your <laughs> cupboard. <laughs> right. That's so true. I, and you yeah. know, I have patients come and see me and the, the, they'll already have tried so many different supplements and usually they'll have this like massive list. And I'm like, where were you buying these? Where were they? How are they recommended? Oh, I just decided to start taking this. I'm like, wait, what? You know, <laughs> supplements are not just something to willy nilly just try on your own. They definitely are made for a specific effect. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I mean, you have to be careful too like with, yeah. And you have to be careful too with, with medications or if you have existing health conditions mm -hmm. that there's a lot of potential interactions and side effects that can, you can actually make yourself worse. So you mm -hmm. do have to be really careful. Yeah. yeah, that's true. And that's one thing about working like with a naturopathic doctor, um, or someone that's an expert in knowing those specifics about interactions, because, you know, mm -hmm. if you go see a typical MD or allopathic physician, they're not going to know about herbal interactions. They're not trained in it. So thank God we're right. trained in both. So when you're looking at you're working with someone with a, a specific, like you said, like FODMAP or something, what are some of the issues that you see or what issues is such a strange word. What are some of the things that you see, like the deeper things that are often missed when people are coming in just and with that, when they've only tried working on the diet, um, like are there different things? I don't know, mindset or different aspects. Oh, for you sure. see that yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think, yeah, a lot of people tend to fixate on diet and sometimes supplements too. So I came up with called the six pillars, foundational pillars of gut healing. So that's diet, your microbiome, your stress response, your immune system, um, support and connection and sleep. So mm. all of these play a huge role in our gut health and overall health, including mental health and our ability to make healthy choices long-term and sustain this healthy lifestyle. And so a lot of people do fixate on diet and supplements without working on their stress levels. So obviously we can't avoid stress, but we can add practices to our life, like deep breathing, 
like meditation, having a, a bedtime routine that allows us to wind down for sleep, getting sunlight exposure during the day so we can keep our circadian rhythm optimized and, mm-hmm. and be able to sleep when the sun goes down and <laughs> all of that. So it's just these simple kind of lifestyle strategies. And a lot of people may come back at me and say, either that's too woo for them, or I don't have time is probably the issue that they complain they don't have time. And to that, I say, I'm thinking in my head, I usually think, how badly do you want to get better? And yeah. also <laughs> the, typically it's more about just assessing where are you spending your time? So you're saying you don't have time, but you're spending uh, an hour or two watching Netflix or scrolling your phone <laughs> or whatever it may be. So really taking a critical look at where they are spending their time mm-hmm. and rearranging that so that they can fit in a little bit of um, extra, you know, stress management practices, for example. And it really doesn't take that much. Like even five or mm-hmm. 10 minutes can make a huge difference. Yeah, that's so true. And there's lots of in- studies that have been done to show that mindset practices are very healing. It's not just mm-hmm. woo woo, <laughs> right? Like yes, you said, there's science. There, yeah, there's, <laughs> it's a very evidence based. There's lots of studies that have been done. You can go to PubMed and look at the different studies and connected to the gut, for instance, connected mm-hmm. breathing techniques, like you mentioned, because these are, we're finding more and more that these techniques are actually the root of the healing. <laughs> yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I was actually listening to a podcast the other day on chronic pain and the role of um, the brain and, and stress and trauma and like issues with relationships growing up and whatnot. So people that had tried all, pretty much everything, including injections for pain and everything like that, and still weren't seeing any relief. And then once they started doing some of these emotional release techniques um, and kind of brain retraining, so to speak, then they started having a massive uh, shift in their pain mm-hmm. levels. So really yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Our emotional body is so important with our physical body. They're like, they're connected. Mm-hmm. They're, people always start with the little boxes. No, <laughs> you have to work yes. on both. <laughs> yeah. I think the biggest thing that I tell people is kind of Western philosophy or Western medicine tends to look at the body as a machine and, oh, that's broken. Okay. Take this pill or that's broken. Do this surgery or whatever mm-hmm. it is. And certainly that's important sometimes in treating critical illness, but When in Eastern or more naturopathic or holistic medicine, we like to look at the body as like an ecosystem. Mm. So everything is connected and one change in one area is going to impact all the other areas. So really keeping that in mind with your choices. That's yeah. so true. I love that you brought that up because it's very important to have to understand those differences in the thought process because many people have been trained in that Western thought process, right? I'll take this pill, mm-hmm. everything will be groovy. I'll be back to normal. My life will resume. I'm like, wait, yeah. but you're just suppressing your body's natural ability to heal and you're actually making things worse. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Oftentimes these treatments, while they can reduce our suffering, often have a lot of side effects and consequences and causing more health problems down the road, such as NSAIDs, so painkillers, right? Right, yeah, or antibiotics, uh, which can be helpful sometimes in the moment needed, but they're so so often over-prescribed for just Mm willy-nilly, and then they do havoc. I was just reading this study recently said that probiotics can change the microbiome for up to nine years. Probiotics? (laughs) Probiotics? <laughs> no, 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 antibiotics. Sorry. Antibiotics. Oh, antibiotics. Can, oh, okay. Yeah, antibiotics can change a microbiome wow. after nine years, which is crazy. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's scary. <laughs> I know, right? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. yes, it's important. But at least we to... know. Yeah, at least we know these days that, you know, what needs to be done after or and or during an antibiotic course, because sometimes right. they are necessary. But if you're yes. working with a practitioner like myself, or at least we can, while you're doing it, you can take a probiotic as long as it's spaced out from the antibiotic. And you can also right. continue right. afterwards so that to mitigate the effects of the antibiotic. And I don't know about yourself, but in my practice, pretty much every client I see when I ask them about their history of um, antibiotic use, almost all of them say that they use them frequently in childhood, whether that was for Mm -hmm. strep throat or chronic ear infections, sinus infections, whatever it may be, they were having these chronic infections and taking antibiotics quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And now they have chronic gut issues. It's very common. I I think they were Mm -hmm. given out. I don't know. Maybe there was a time period when they were given out a lot. They're still given out a lot, but I think people are (laughs) becoming waking up to know that is not something that is good, especially when they're overprescribed and given out for not necessarily the right reason. Now, of course, that's that being said, sometimes they really are needed, which Mm -hmm. that's when we want to turn to them. That's when they were developed by Marie Curie. Let's talk about stool testing as we're wrapping up today. I want to make sure what is stool testing? Why is it important? When would 
do you do a stool test for someone? <laughs> yeah. So there's a couple different types of stool testing. First of all, maybe I'll back up and just explain why we use them and, and why they're important. Yeah. So typically when I work with a client, especially someone that's been struggling and they've been trying all these different diets and supplements, especially if they've already seen other practitioners and mm -hmm. they've tried some of these four-step protocols. Uh, for gut healing and they're still feeling that's when I say, okay, we need to do this, this stool test to know exactly what's going on in there because I, otherwise we're going to be wasting time and money and effort and just getting spinning our wheels, not knowing exactly what's going on in there. And so there are different types of testing. There's culture-based tests. So where they're mm -hmm. taking the stool sample and growing what's in there in a Petri dish in the lab. Those ones I don't like as much because they only culture and grow what is alive when it comes right. out. <laughs> there are bacteria that were living in your gut and now they're dead when they come out. And so they're not actually going to show up on the culture test. Um, so the one that I typically use is called the GI map, and that mm -hmm. is a PCR based test. I know you probably use that too in your practice. And I love that it's PCR based. So it shows us all of the microbes, whether dead or alive, and it's very specific for the strain. And it tells us the amount as well in exponential notation because it's right. quite a lot. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah. And then it also groups it in terms of normal bacteria that are opportunistic and take over when there's an imbalance and um, potential autoimmune trigger bacteria mm -hmm. or microbes, as well as yeasts and viruses and parasites. Yeah. It's and then very inclusive. <laughs> yeah. It's very inclusive. Yeah. Versus I know I like to just make a differentiation where people say, well, why don't I just go get a stool test from my doctor? It's, it's right. free. Right. And so you could do that, but I'm not sure exactly how many things they test for, but it is only a handful, I believe. Right. Very tiny. <laughs> so a couple of parasites, a couple of bacteria, and only the ones that cause really serious illness, as well as I think they test for steatocrit maybe and fecal blood. So blood in the stool. Right. Yeah. Um, like E. coli and um, yeah. they'll test for uh, C. diff and things that are definitely mm -hmm. like a super <laughs> important to test yeah. for, but they're missing all the rest of the good and bad bacteria. <laughs> yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. So the other part that I love about the test too, is it has a section um, of measuring digestion and mm -hmm. um, inflammation. So yeah. that helps us know whether we have a potential autoimmune uh, illness on our hands, such as potential Crohn's or colitis. It helps us know the immune function in the gut. So that's mm -hmm. IgA levels. And it helps us know whether you're absorbing fat properly, how your pancreas is functioning with the digestive enzyme output, and so much more. Really helpful in um, telling me exactly what I need to focus on for a client, whether that should we focus on killing uh, bacteria because <laughs> we have a lot of overgrowth of bad guys or should we focus more on rebuilding or should we do both at the same time so it really mm -hmm. just depends on what they have going on if they have really low levels of healthy bacteria especially if they're getting recurrent utis or something i'm really going to focus on rebuilding that microbiome to get their immune function up Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you for explaining that because it's a great test and super important. And I think people don't understand the difference between going to their regular primary care physician and just having a stool test, which is ONP yeah. times three, just going to be very basic as exposed, as opposed to getting a real full, like it's called a map for a reason, right? It's giving yeah. us this whole huge inside picture, which is really important if we're trying to help someone heal their gut. Yes, exactly. And it allows us to make progress. I always say fast forward your gut healing journey a lot faster than it would be if we were just guessing, taking right. a shot in the dark saying, it sounds like you have potential SIBO or it sounds like you have insufficiency dysbiosis right. where you don't have enough good guys, but there's no way to know for sure without actually doing the test. Yeah. yeah and I think guessing is not the route for healing. We want to be, mm -hmm. we want to be specific, not a way to suppress the body. We want to help the body and get, the testing gives us like the bigger map, the, the bigger picture. We can really see what's yeah. going on instead of maybe for a year, you were guessing and then trying different things like, oh, look, we can have this information tomorrow and we could actually help you. Okay, Holly. So as we're wrapping up, uh, what would be, I know you already gave some great tips for balancing the gut. So what, let's have one last one, like woo, the big hurrah. What would be like, if you're like, okay, no matter what, hands down, this would be my like number one. Stop Googling and self-prescribing and go see a practitioner. <laughs> 
<laughs> Yay, totally. Yes, I agree. Yes. 100%. Yeah. Do not use yeah. Google as your doctor or your friend. Don't use your friend as your doctor either because your friend is not, you have totally. a different gut, <laughs> you're different, yes. whatever, different, totally different. System. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what works for your friend might not. Okay. So let's talk about how people can find you on the website, how they can follow you <clears throat> on Instagram. And then your awesome fix your gut formula. Yeah. So you can find me on Instagram at mindful underscore vitality. I'm also on Facebook at the same name. So mindful vitality. I do have a Facebook group called the fix your gut collective. And I also have the fix your gut formula. So that is the course that I built, including an eight module video course for you to get empowered, to understand why you have gut issues and how to heal. And it also includes a recipe collection with lots of gut-friendly, allergen-friendly recipes, as well as some videos and masterclasses with a variety of practitioners to help you understand how different healing modalities can help as well. So that's available on my website, which is mindfulvitality.ca. And I also offer one-on-one sessions online through Verger Wellness Clinic. Awesome. That's great, yeah. Holly. Yay. I love that. We'll put all that in the show notes. So everybody that's listening can easily find there. And one last question as we're wrapping up, if you had an unlimited budget right now, what would you do to make the biggest impact on the planet? Ooh, that's a good question. Oh goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I would say probably more in terms of transportation, like getting rid of fossil fuels and, and switching to all green energy, like electric mm. cars and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. I love that one. It's going to happen. I always think back to like what we've already manifested, like the Jetsons. That was like so long ago. We have all these different sci-fi things that our minds can create. So why can't we create like something where we don't use any fuel from the planet and we know it can happen. So exactly. Yeah. And we already have yes. the technology. It's just other factors right. at play here. I know. <laughs> yes. So that's not going to be too far off. I think we're going to see that in our yeah. lifetime. I hope, For sure. I hope yeah. so too. Not too far off. Thanks again, Holly. It's been a joy to talk to you today and learn all about the gut. I can't wait to yeah, share it with the world. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. Thanks again. You're welcome.